You've decided you're ready to become a parent, and suddenly you're overwhelmed with people who feel they have the right to inform you on the correct way to conceive, give birth, what fears you should have, and the proper way to parent. How do you filter through the opinions? How do you know what's trustworthy information and what's a myth or just plain outdated? Welcome to the Birth Ease Podcast. Join your host, Michelle Smith, and her guests as they cut through the noise and fear by sharing valuable tips, tools, and proven methods that help you connect with your own inner wisdom as you navigate the sacred journey that is pregnancy, birth, and parenthood in a more relaxed and confident manner. This podcast does not constitute, nor is it intended, as medical advice. Hello, Birthies families. Welcome to your reprieve from the noise and the stress that can often accompany pregnancy, birth, and parenthood. I'm your host, Michelle Smith. In today's episode, I'm so excited and grateful to have back with me once again, Kathy Bradley. Kathy has been a leader in the maternal health field for 30 years. Welcome, Kathy, once again to the Birthies Podcast. I'm so grateful to have you here with me again. I love hanging out with you on your podcasts. Yeah, thank you. I feel like we just have some really deep and amazing conversations that are pertinent to families. Mm -hmm. And so in this conversation, I'd really appreciate it if we could discuss tongue ties because it's coming up so frequently Mm -hmm. with my clients and there's so many questions regarding it. And so I'm just, again, so grateful that you are willing to hop on and do this interview with me so that we can give families some guidance regarding that. Yeah, there's a lot of action happening around tongue ties as a internationally board certified lactation consultant. In my private practice, I do see it. I monitor some of the mommy boards on social media and and get insights and just kind of follow and see what's going on. Hundreds of years ago, the stories that have been passed down is that if a midwife were delivering a baby that, and this is way beyond even before obstetrics as we understand it today, if they could see clearly that the frenulum, as we call it, the tight little piece of skin, if you lift your tongue up, They would take their fingernail or, you know, I dare say scalpel, because I don't even know that they had them way back then, but they would just clip it. You know, they would like run their finger and release the tie. And over the years in private practice, you see more and more of it. So the question always in my mind is, do we see it more because we know more or is something actually happening? It's like cancers. You know, years ago, cancers weren't at the level that we see them today. A lot of people, it's our foods, it's our sugars that we're eating. There's a lot of things that contribute into that. And so when we look at tongue ties, it's the same thing. A blanket statement I say about tongue ties, and there's more than one kind of tongue tie. There's an anterior, which is the one we visibly typically see. Sometimes the tongue is in a heart shape Mm -hmm. when the baby tries to stick the tongue out or the child, depending on how old they are being diagnosed. And then there's a posterior, which is a very hidden. And even in my own private practice, it took a long time before I was really good at spotting those. And now here's the other piece. Just because we spot them doesn't mean they need to be revised. Mm. So we look at functionality. We look at all the different parts and pieces that are going on. At least I do in my private practice before I refer a mom and baby for a revision, you know, to be diagnosed by a provider. And I'm either going to refer to a pediatric ear, nose, and throat or a pediatric dentist. Okay. And then there's the oral motor specialist as well. Right. Where does that fit in? Well, oral motor, they often can recognize and identify. When I refer to oral motor is if a baby has a tie and let's say they're four months, six months old, and you're Picking up on this, I mean, as a board certified lactation consultant, we're not technically supposed to diagnose, but we know what's normal and what's not normal. Right. And so if I believe that the baby has a tie, I'm going to refer them to an ENT or a pediatric dentist to confirm what I suspect. And if they go ahead and do the revision, oftentimes these babies need oral motor because the tongue, think about a muscle that's been tightened down. It does not know how to function. Yeah. 
it needs to be worked and they have to learn how to use that, if you will, the movement in the mouth and what to do and to strengthen the muscles in the oral cavity in order to really draw the milk out of the breast. So oral motor sometimes comes in if it's really severe or if the baby's a little bit older and we're doing that. Okay. So what would be signs of concern or things for families to look for concerning tongue tie? Okay. Usually the more common is mom's going to have extreme pain on the nipples despite trying to get the best latch that she can. Okay. You know, typically we teach if your nipples are hurting, there is something wrong. So in the first thing we always look for is latch. So is baby's mouth opening wide? Is the nipple going deep into the mouth? I usually have parents run their tongue along the roof of the mouth, their own mouth. We can go all the way back to the soft and hard juncture, the palate where it meets. If you put your tongue back there, it's really far back. So what happens is that nipple needs to come all the way back. So as that tongue moves and what we call a peristaltic movement, that nipple is going up against that soft palate. If it's not deep enough, it's hitting the roof of the mouth. And that's where you'll get the compression looking, the nipples, the cracked. And that's a sign that the nipple isn't going back far enough. Well, with a tie, depending if it's an anterior or posterior, Part of that tongue action of the baby is pulling that nipple deep into the mouth. Mm -hmm. Every time that tongue moves, it continues to keep that nipple in. Now, another part of the dynamics of the mouth in the baby is the upper lip tie. Right. So now we're going to discuss a third type. When you lift your lip up, if you used your thumb and your pointer fingers, right, and grab both sides of your lip and try to cover your nose, like you're going to lift and come up over, you're going to see that frenulum. If that frenulum, and there's different grades that the specialist will use to identify, is it a grade one, two, three, four, that kind of thing. If that lifting that lip up to the nose, if the skin blanches, turns white, does not stay pink and supple with blood flow, Mm. then we know it's tight. Mm. That upper lip is a contribution to that baby being able to stay on the breast. So oftentimes when we talk to parents, we'll say, your baby's lips should be flanged like a fish. Well, that means that upper lip should be nice up and out. A baby with a very tight upper frenulum You might be able to release it a little bit, but two or three or four sucks, you'll see that upper lip begin to curl in an effort to kind of hang on to the breast because oftentimes if you have an upper tie, there's some level of a lower tie. They call it, I don't like the name, but it's often referred to as a midline defect, Mm. right? The tie, you might've heard the MTHFR gene Yes. connected. We're seeing more of that connection. So when the tongue and the upper lip can't hold on as well, the nipple is tends to ride back out of that baby's mouth, which puts the nipple onto the hard palate, which is where it's causing the pain. But also it reduces the transfer of milk flow Mm. because baby's not back far enough. So typically the number one thing is going to be nipple pain. Doesn't always have to be, but usually that is the number one thing. Then it's lack of milk transfer, Okay. right? And so milk removal equals milk production. Right. So if baby isn't draining and getting all that milk out, then it's not signaling the mom's breast that, hey, baby was at restaurant. They ate this meal. We need to begin preparing another meal before baby comes back to the restaurant to eat again. Right. So we look at what is mom's comfort level? Is the baby transferring milk? I just saw a baby yesterday. I really, in my head, this baby's three weeks old, has been gaining weight, but mom was reporting very painful nipples. Well, when I got there, it was just a poor latch. She wasn't getting the baby deep enough on. Mm. When I helped her, better positioned her, and assisted on that better latch, her eyes got wide. She's like, oh my gosh, this is not killing me. Mm. And so this baby was a little bit tight, but 
if this mom can work and do the things that I suggested and she can resolve her nipple pain and the baby is transferring adequate amounts, doesn't matter if I see that it looks like there's some tightness there, I'm not going to refer them for revision because why put the baby through that when everything else is fine? Right. So the rule of thumb is just because we see that something looks like it might be tight doesn't mean it's an automatic revision for me in practice. I really look at functionality. Okay. I look at mom's pain level, how much baby's transferring, what's going on. Sometimes you can have a mom that has a very strong milk ejection reflex. And that's where baby shows up at the breast restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does a little suckling at the breast. There's a message that goes up to the pituitary that says baby needs to eat. Oxytocin and prolactin are produced. It squeezes the milk producing cells and down comes a rush of milk. Some women have a nice volume of milk and a rush in the first two to three weeks, that milk ejection reflex alone is enough to kind of keep that baby hydrated, peeing and pooping. Mm. But we hit around the three to four week mark and we're assuming baby has ties, right? And not causing mom pain. But all of a sudden now, the breast begins to calibrate, if you will. That's what I call it. How much supply and demand is needed at around the three to four week mark, it begins to kind of level off. So when the placenta clears the body, it signals the body to go from feeding the baby in her utero to now we're going to feed at the restaurant. So progesterone drops, in comes what we call lactogenesis two. It's most commonly understood as the milk coming in, but really mom has colostrum already and it just increases the volume of that. Mm -hmm. And so at around the three to four week, the breast begins what I call calibrating to try to decide how much is being removed because remember milk removal equals milk production. So a baby that has a tie, but mom has maybe a higher volume and a really nice milk ejection reflex has kind of been, baby's kind of getting that handicap if you will. Right. But as the breast begins to settle down, then sometimes I see where baby can't really bring a lot of the milk out past the milk ejection reflex. And then we get a volume issue going on. Gotcha. So I hope I'm not overwhelming the listeners with information, <laughs> but just trying to give some, you know, it's not always cut and dry. One reason I love lactation is because I always feel like I am an investigator. Mm hmm. You know, I'm going in and I have to investigate. And I have to think of all these different parts and pieces and a picture begins being produced. And I love solving problems. That's why I love lactation. It's not always, there's anything in life. It's not always black and white. Right. So. Right. There's all these nuances within it. Uh -huh. So if a family needs to be referred out to an ENT, or a pediatric dentist, what would they look for in that provider? What type of questions would they want to ask? Great question. In the local community where they are, I would connect with at least two or three different lactation consultants and ask them who they refer to. Not only the lactation consultant, maybe they are seen. I do encourage people to see a knowledgeable lactation consultant. And just because you pass your boards doesn't mean you have an extensive amount of experience. So really finding somebody that is very experienced is always a plus. But what is the knowledge and experience of the provider? You can get into some of the Facebook groups and they have preferred providers they've identified like all over the United States. Mm. Let me give you a story one time that was a great, I wouldn't say lesson, but it's an experience I'll always remember. So I had a mama who had a four month old and I got a phone call and I believe the birth weight was eight pounds, nine ounces. And at four months of age, this baby was nine pounds, eight ounces. Mm. So way, way under, we term that failure to thrive. Right. They had been put into a children's hospital here to the Orlando area and had been in five days. Now this mama had been pumping and storing her breast milk, but wasn't supplementing the baby with her pumped breast milk. So when the baby gets put into the hospital, 
she works with the pediatricians and says, we'll do a pre-weight and a post-weight so you can tell how much the baby is getting. And then whatever the baby did not get equaling two ounces, she would supplement with her pumped breast milk. And they were fine with that. In the meantime, the baby goes through all this test. She tells me that a lactation consultant or somebody that was deemed lactation came and looked at the latch. And while she was there, the baby gained four ounces. So five days put through all these tests and the babies gained four ounces. They couldn't find any reason at all. Well, in my head, I immediately, I'm going to a couple different options here. I do the home visit. I take a glove. I look in the mouth and immediately I see a posterior tie. Mm. So I explain to this mama what I feel and I refer her to a pediatric ENT. She had to go a county over. She calls. The ENT is booked and then he's on vacation. So unbeknownst to me, she calls a local pediatric ENT, takes the baby in. She then calls me and says, the ENT said there's nothing wrong in this baby's mouth. Now, as a provider, I had to navigate this very carefully. And I said to her, how did that Mm -hmm. make you feel? And she goes, extremely frustrated. And I said, how do you feel about the information that I've given you? And she says, of everybody, you're like, you're seeing, you're looking in this baby's mouth. Well, I asked her, I said, when this lactation person came and looked, did they glove? Did they look in the baby's mouth or did they just literally look at the baby on the breast? And she goes, the baby was feeding and they just looked and said, oh, it looks like a good latch. Mm. I said, did they send this baby to oral motor? And she said, no. Well, I will tell you, I was very frustrated and very mad. I don't usually get like that, but I was because here, my bottom line is this baby's gaining because we're feeding and supplementing. So obviously there's a problem from getting where these breasts are to where the stomach is. That leaves the mouth. That's the, that's the bridge, if you will, from the breast to the baby is the mouth. Why aren't we looking more in this mouth? They were doing ultrasounds, metabolic screenings. They were doing all kinds of stuff to this baby. Wow. So I said, okay, why don't you go to oral motor? Because this little baby, when he would even nurse, his little jaw just quivered back and forth, which is a sign of absolute exhaustion. Mm -hmm. So I said, go ahead and go to oral motor because he's going to need to strengthen his mouth. And they will also most likely confirm what. I feel I am addressing and you can get in faster and then go from there. So what she did is she made appointment back with the ENT, the pediatric ENT that was a County over. In the meantime, made an appointment with oral motor, oral motor confirmed what I had saw and seen. And then she kept the appointment because remember now the baby's gaining because she knows to breastfeed and then supplement. Mm -hmm. And she was okay doing that. Right. So baby's gaining. He's on that trajectory. She goes over gets the revision and turns her whole breastfeeding relationship around. Wow. Amazingly, because often the tongue ties, they are DNA. She had another baby and day two or three, she was in getting the tongue tied. She sent me pictures and I went, yep, tied again. This baby's tied and she wasn't even going to mess around. So that just goes to show you how frustrating. It makes me wonder how many babies have had issues And you go to a provider that's a doctor and you're told nothing's wrong and yet there really was an issue. And that was a really big eye-opening thing for me because it was like everything is not created equal. And it is highly controversial. There's pediatricians that don't believe ties exist. There are oral motor therapists that don't believe ties exist. (laughs) It's very interesting. And I'm glad you're doing this podcast. I don't know that I'm going to be able to give any groundbreaking information, except each family has to navigate themselves if they're in this situation and do what is right for them. You know, I've had cases where there's definitely a tie and the parents make the decision not to go through the procedure. Now, who I refer to uses what most people would understand as a laser, just cauterization. There's an ENT at Nemours Clinic locally here that will put the baby under general and use scissors Mm. in some of the field on a national level. 
there's professionals that say there's really not a difference between the two. I just like the fact that using cauterization, which is seconds, literally releasing that tissue, baby doesn't have to undergo anesthesia and doesn't have to deal with stitches. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm always going to prefer just for those reasons, a provider. And then on top of that, we have the issue of insurance because think about it. How many babies, newborn babies have dental insurance? Oh, true. And I will tell you the pediatric dentists, in my opinion, are the forerunners, those that do understand are trained and are doing this because think about the mouth, a baby that has a tie, especially an interior, the front ties. Think about what you do when you eat, you clean your teeth with your tongue Mm. before you get that toothbrush. Think about having to lick a ice cream cone. If you can't extend your tongue out, you can't lick. Now a posterior tie, the tongue can come out. It can't lift midline. It's so interesting here. I'm talking with my hands, but we're doing this audio (laughs) podcast. It cracks me up. But um, I'm explaining to your audience how the tongue should be moving. But, you know, the interesting thing is, is that the dentists really, in my opinion, you'll find more dentists, more knowledgeable. And I've read cases where you have adults that get revised, their headaches, their back, their tension. It's amazing that when that tongue is held down, the effects that it can have on the body. Mm. Well, and it can affect your speech too. Some people say yes and some people say no. And I think it all depends uniquely to the mouth. And so once again, you'll see I'm stepping very carefully because, you know, practicing medicine is considered practicing. It's not perfected medicine. Mm -hmm. It's always learning and finding new things. If you don't mind, can we jump back to the MTHFR gene? Yes, please, please. Okay. So What happens there, and I'm going to try to talk in layman's terms because I'm not like super PhD in this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) This is how my understanding of it is that when that gene is turned on and there's different kinds of MTHFR genes, what it does is it affects our abilities to break down and detox certain things in our system. So where some of the findings are is that if you're an MTHFR gene and you have this thing turned on, you do not break down folic acid. Mm -hmm. Now, folate is in its natural state. Right. Folic acid is, I hate to use the word conjugated, but it's, let's just say it's more synthesized, if you will. It's created. It's not in its natural state. Right. We'll go back to the 80s and the 90s. What was the big push for neurotube defects? Get folic acid. Make sure you get lots of folic acid. Yeah, exactly. So you find it in cereals, you find it in your prenatal vitamins. So if somebody is that carrier of that gene, and it's turned on, we see a higher incident of the midline, the tongues, the calyx, there's other things that you can find with the MTHFR gene, but we see it with the ties. Mm -hmm. So a friend of mine who's an OB, we talk about all this prenatal testing that, my gosh, if we could find out early enough and women could do folate, because you can find prenatal vitamins with just folate, and then you have to read labels because folic acid is in a lot of things, Mm -hmm. we could minimize. And I think for me right now as a practitioner, that's where I think and why we are seeing more. I think it has to do with the folic acid. I think that's a big piece of it. Yeah. And then genetics just continues to pass itself through. Right. I remember Annette Leary saying that years ago, being concerned about the folic acid and observing an increase in tongue ties. Uh huh. And that was years ago. Uh huh. Yeah. And the crazy thing about that mutated gene, if you will. And this is like a whole other podcast that I wouldn't be knowledgeable enough on, but I know just enough to be dangerous, so to speak. But when you take medications and you have that, you do not detox those out of your body as easily. Mm. I'm a carrier. My children didn't have it, but my grandchildren, one did. And we've gone back and looked and she did the folic acid 
stuff all the way through, come to find out my other two girls didn't take prenatal vitamins. They made them sick, so they didn't take them. Oh, wow. And that was really interesting to look at that. I can't say conclusively that that's why these three didn't have tongue ties, but this one did, but it sure points in that direction, right? But it's not an absolute. But then my one daughter had just a lot of troubles in medications and it caused some real severe problems with her postpartum because things started building up in her system Mm -hmm. because her body could not detox. Well, you take the level of sugars that we consume and then you take the level of dairy, which is inflammatory to the body, and then you get that gene. It really can create issues. And then there's the whole thing about immunizations, right? And I'm not going to touch that one with a 10-foot pole because we're so polarized on what we think. But if you were to even think, why is it that some children have these reactions and some don't? I would love to see a study that goes back and looked at children that have had reactions. Do they have the MTHFR gene? Mm. And was it turned on? And is that why they got a reaction? Because they're getting pumped with these things that are foreign to the body, but the body doesn't know how to take out what it doesn't need, right? And then you get a reaction. Yes. Some of my mamas that have that gene, they have expressed concern Mm -hmm. about the vaccine reactions. And one of our local pediatricians has as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think it's a very valid concern. And it's one of those things, again, you know, science is amazing because it can reveal a lot of things, but then it puts us in a quandary. I mean, what is it, California that has mandatory vaccination? Mm -hmm. I mean, if I knew what I know now and I was having a child in California, I'd be really concerned because I would surely want to minimize my child's risk. And knowing what I know and what I've studied, I, I would hope that I could move out of California so that I wouldn't have to do that. And I'm not saying that people don't need to immunize their children because I want to be very careful. I think you have to be educated, but I think as parents, we need to have the right to choose what gets put into our bodies. Right. Yep. It's one of those very heated and passionate yes. conversations it's on, bo- mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, on both yep. sides. Absolutely. And I feel there's legitimacy on both sides. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So... I know for myself, I have clients that if the tongue tie revision is suggested, they get very concerned about the effects for the baby and if it's going to be very painful for the baby, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And usually I will share. And again, I'm not like we were talking about a moment ago, I'm not trying to sway anybody one way or the other. But speaking from personal experience, I had a very severe upper lip tie and I had to have it released when I was eight years old Uh and I did go to the dentist. So I think that's really interesting as you were talking about the pediatric dentist, Uh but I remember it and it wasn't devastating, but it was a, a little an owie, (laughs) a little, well, it was just a little scary Uh and I didn't really understand what was going on. And I wouldn't say it was horribly painful Uh that I remember it was sore and it kind of burned, but it was kind of a little traumatic. Like Uh I'm 54 and I still remember it. Uh And I had to go to speech therapy for years because it affected my speech. Uh And So when clients ask me, I usually share that story. And so Uh I will always suggest listen to your gut, listen to your baby, and sometimes listen to your breasts. Are they telling you because they're so sore? But if you're going to have it done, I feel like doing it as a baby is potentially less traumatic and could prevent possible implications with the speech, if it's severe, like a mine was. Right. Well, a lot of times people don't realize it, but we've all known people that have a gap in their center upper teeth. Mm -hmm. And I did. Yeah. Yep. And often a really thick class five will go down around that center of the gum Mm -hmm. in a newborn. And you can just see when those teeth come in, they'll come and stay apart because that frenulum is so tight and thick. Mm Mm-hmm depending on the severity of it, 
sometimes I have had cases where everything breastfeeding is kind of going okay, but we see that and it is very thick and it's that prerogative to the parent as always is, but I'm of the opinion it's better to have them done as an infant than to wait later in life. Mm -hmm. Some people choose to wait and that's fine. That's the privilege of being a parent. Mm -hmm. You get to make those decisions, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I am more of let's get it done when they're little. If we need it, then we do it when they're young. Yeah. And when you use the cauterization, it literally, I've gotten it on procedures and they papoose them and they put their protective eye gear on and it literally is five seconds, 10 seconds of releasing the tissue and it's done. That's amazing. Depending on per where, now if they have an upper and a lower, then it's like five or 10 seconds top, five or 10 seconds at the bottom to make sure everything's released right. And you do want a good provider. You don't want to over-release and you don't want to under, you know, you want to make sure you're liberating the tongue as it needs to, or the upper lip. So it is important to go to somewhere where it's referred. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense to me. When my last baby was born, I was concerned because when her teeth came in, she had a gap Uh and I was worried because it looked like she could have an upper lip tie and knowing my own history. Uh And our pediatrician was great because he said, let's just keep an eye on it. She's nursing okay. Everything is going all right. Let's just watch it and see if it resolves itself, if it presents any issues. And he was exactly right. It just Uh resolved itself. He's like, I'm not too concerned, but we can keep an eye on it. Whereas I was like, oh my gosh, Uh does she have it as well? So right. I think there is wisdom too sometimes and let's just observe it because she was gaining weight. We were transferring milk well and all of that. There are probably a small percentage that I see that are like, yeah, there's, this has got to get revised. Like in my inside head, right? Like this needs to be revised. Mm -hmm. And I will gently tell parents this. I'm of the professional opinion that you'd have a very small chance of correcting anything, you know, like sore nipples or transferring unless it's revised. However, I'm going to always point out, can we get a better latch positioning, you know, going through those basics and tell parents go for another three to five days. See if things get better. If they get better, fine. If they don't, then that tells you that leaves you less options of what needs to transpire. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. I had one mama that went two or three weeks and her husband was getting transferred to Alabama and she looked over there and she's like, there's no really good providers around. And she kind of made this like last minute decision. I think the baby by then was like four or five weeks old and they were going to be moving like in a week or two or something. And she's like, you know what? I think I'm just going to go do it because if I get over there and things don't turn around, then what happens for her? It was night and day. Mm. Oh, that's good night and day. She was like, Oh my gosh, I'm so glad I did this. And she was, I can't believe that for the last three weeks when you identified it, because I happened to be at the delivery, it was her doula as well, that, you know, it needed to be done. She goes, I just kept thinking, maybe it'll change. Maybe it'll change. Mm. She goes, I wish I'd done this three weeks ago. Well, hindsight's always 2020 and we don't know. Right. And so I told her no shame in the game. You know, you made the decisions you needed to, and you did what you needed to do. And thank goodness you see the change now. Yeah. So if maybe a lactation consultant or someone else points out the possibility of a tongue tie or a lip tie, do you recommend getting a second opinion? Um, I think it depends on the parent and it depends on the experience of the consultant. Okay. You know, if you're seeing a consultant that's maybe been practicing one to three years, five years, maybe I would get a second opinion. But in my area, they've got to go to the provider. And the provider is the ultimate one who's going to make that decision whether to do it or not. One of the providers that I go to, he will not take anybody that just calls and says, I think my kid has a tongue tie. He wants a referral from a lactation consultant. Okay. Of the ones I've referred to him, only one And he called me and said, I see what you see, but I think they can turn this around. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm going to wait. They did end up going back and he did end up revising. But, you know, we have a great relationship where he called me. He said, no, you're on the mark all the time. So that's always 
a relief for me because I don't want to take a baby. These babies are usually anywhere from a week old to three weeks. This mom's trying to recover. They're up nursing all the time. They're exhausted. Somewhere there's usually painful nursing. Like I said, it's majority of the issues. And then we're going to go put a baby through a procedure. And then there's recovery from that. So believe me, I prefer not to. But also sometimes we just have to go ahead and do what we need to do to get past and make better the situation of, you know, what they're dealing with. So my recommendation would be if someone has gone to a lactation consultant and they're saying that they have a tie, usually the provider and who they're sending them to should do an evaluation. The one provider that I prefer to go to, it's like a $50 and he'll tell you yes or no. Will he do it? Will he not? You know, does he see that there's a tie that needs revision? And if you do it, that $50 gets applied to the revision if you do it then. Wow. That's great. Yeah. So I don't know that I would go to another consultant okay. because ultimately it's the provider who's going to make that decision. Okay. They're the ones that are trained at releasing them or should be trained at releasing them. So they should have way more experience doing them. Okay. If that makes sense. Okay. I don't know that I would go to another consultant. I have had cases where people call me and they've maybe been somewhere to a consultant or they've heard that I'm pretty knowledgeable in it. I don't want to say I'm an expert in it, but when you have a lot of years experience, you do get good at what you do, but I will minimize down what my cost usually is to literally glove and go in that mouth and take a quick look. You know, I will do that. There's sometimes I will have people send me pictures. I'll send pictures to them of what I'm looking for and they send it to me mm. and I'll say, yes, I can absolutely see it. And based on what they've told me, go ahead and okay. go to an ENT or a, a pediatric dentist. Okay. So do the pediatric dentists ever confer with lactation consultants to understand the mechanisms better or is that just inherent? Well, I think providers, if they're really concerned they're going to understand why the tongue does what it needs to do. But let's just take breastfeeding out of it. Okay. If you have a baby that has a tie and a pretty tight one, especially the anteriors, that tongue cannot move around to clean. So when this child is three and four years old, and five and six, they're going to have dental caries. They're going to have way more mm. Because they can't move the tongue. Think about when you eat something that's in your teeth, what are you doing? You're back there with your tongue, uh, uh, getting that food out. Yes, yes. So aside from breastfeeding, right, a baby that has an anterior tie, not so much posterior, but the anteriors or the thick upper tie, it's going to cause dental problems. That's why the dentists seem to be the ones that are more knowledgeable. I'm not saying pediatricians can't. But think about the pediatrician. That pediatrician has to know everything from the head of that baby all the way down to the toes. Mm -hmm. They have to know a lot of things. A dentist, what does he focus in? The mouth. Mm -hmm. So his area, he sees mouth, 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 mouth all the time. I can tell you from my years, just years experience, if I feel the palate of the baby, I can tell you just by feeling the palate if we're more inclined to have a tie or not because of the shape, mm. because a tie, a tongue that's been held down during the baby in the womb forming will actually tend to have a more deep, more like somebody just took a finger up there, like in Play-Doh. Mm. It's not wide. So think about when your whole tongue goes to the roof of your mouth, your tongue touches your teeth to the right and the teeth to the left. A tongue that can't go up, think of this is where using my hands and if we were visual, it would work much better. But we all start as one cell and then it splits mm -hmm. and then it splits again. So everything down our midline, right down the middle of us, mm -hmm. there's an essence, a dividing piece, or there's that line that goes down through. So that palate never widens and goes wider because the tongue never can lift and push to the side the same way a tongue that's loose. Okay. So. That's just years experience. So the more I see, the more I connected the dots of, wait a second, the palate is more inclined to be this way than it is that way. Okay. And it's like a 90% accuracy rate. And that's just, I'm pulling a number. 
this is not studied or published anywhere for those that want to know. This is just my experience as a provider. Right. So going to somebody who knows what they're doing is really important. Right. And we'll put the local providers for Central Florida, we'll place those in Mm -hmm. the show notes for families. Mm -hmm. But I appreciate you taking the time to do this so much. Absolutely. I learned quite a bit just in our conversation. So if you had any last thoughts, any bit of wisdom that you want to leave families with regarding possible tongue ties, what would that be? Mm. You know, I would have to say, trust your gut. If you think something's wrong, something's wrong. If you see a lactation consultant and you feel that, I'm just trying to think like how those scenarios might play out is just trust your gut as a parent. Mm -hmm. If you think something's right or wrong and don't be afraid to reach out for a second opinion, I would say it's not all cookie cutter with that. I mean, we didn't even touch on sacral therapy, acupuncture, chiropractic. Sometimes if it's kind of in that piece of, I'm not like a hundred percent sure that this baby needs to go to have a procedure. I will refer to those three different modalities Mm. to see if we can loosen baby up a little bit and see if they're holding tension somewhere and those providers can release it and baby will nurse better, therefore alleviating the need. Like I said, there are sometimes I look and I go, there's just no way around this. This, If you want to continue breastfeeding, you don't want your nipples to hurt, <laughs> this, is, this is probably what needs to happen. But that's a much rarer percentage. I get a lot of like, as a provider, I'm like, eh, I'm not sure revision is what's needed. And are you willing to look at these other modalities? Yes. So I don't know if that's really answering your questions, except that breastfeeding should not be painful. It should be a pleasant experience. So if those two things are not happening, we really do need to look at why Mm -hmm. and how do we work towards alleviating and mitigating so that it's a warm and fuzzy, even though it's exhausting experience because nothing compares to breast milk and a baby at the breast. Even moms that exclusively pump, it's way better than formula, but I think sometimes we often forget that the mother baby dyad, how they work together is very important to microbials and the defenses. Mm -hmm. So for your listeners, say for instance, somebody comes up and touches your baby's hands and they are going to expose a bacteria. Baby puts the hand to their own mouth. And so now the baby has exposed a bacteria or could be viral to their body. And then they go breastfeed. So when they go to the mother's breast and touch it, The baby is now passing information, that bacterial or virus, to the mother's immune system because the skin is porous. Her body will identify it, create an antibody, put it in the breast milk, and give it back to the baby to protect the baby. There isn't a formula in this world that can do that. And we somewhat reduce that down if we exclusively pump. Now, I'm going to tell you, hands down, I will support a mom however they need to. If they choose to formula feed, then they formula feed. If they want to exclusively pump and feed, I tell them, kiss your baby on the lips all the time. Kiss them. Because you can also pass the information back and forth between the two. Mm -hmm. Even with formula fed. Even though we're not giving breast milk back to the baby if the mom's choosing not to pump her breast. Mm -hmm. Or she can't. Or she's unable to, because sometimes that happens. Right. Yeah. And there are medical conditions. Absolutely. One of my daughters was that way. Yeah. So no guilt, mamas, if you can't. No guilt, no shame. Yes. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Just like for the mamas that choose an epidural, there's no shame in that either. Right. You know, we need to, if anything, I want to leave parents with, do what you need to do and don't worry about what other people think or say. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's your decision. You get the opportunity to govern your body and raise your children. Mm-hmm. And there's no perfect right way to do it. Right. People are going to give you information. Uh, they're going to give you advice. Listen to it. If it works for you, great. If it doesn't, chuck it and move on to the next piece. Yeah. And listen to your gut, your instinct, your inner mm-hmm. wisdom, and listen to your baby. Yep. 
And those two together. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. If a baby's fussy at the breast and breastfeeding isn't going well, there's a reason. One of the things I love to teach parents is to read baby's body language. Mm -hmm. Because it's very telling. They're revealing a story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I love Dunstan baby language. Ah, uh, yes. Because it helps you to understand the baby's cries and then mm -hmm. the happiest baby on the block and learn those five S's and it helps create that communication. So your babies can communicate. We just have to learn how to understand it. We're not versed in right. baby a lot of time. Right. And not that right. it's not difficult sometimes to figure out what's going on. Right. I just feel like that Dunstan baby language makes a huge difference when you learn it. Mm -hmm. And with breastfeeding too, yep. I have gone in and helped at a breastfeeding support group through one of the hospitals. And there was a brand new baby. They knew it was time for the baby to nurse and the baby was at the breast and the baby was saying, eh, 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 which is I need to burp. Burp. Uh -huh. And I heard it. And so I said, why don't you try burping her? And they did. Baby let out a big old burp, put baby back to the breast, and she latched right away. Uh -huh. And so I feel like it can just, that's a whole nother podcast right there, Dunstan and, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and breastfeeding. So that'll yep. be another one of our projects together. Yep. So is there anything else you want to leave the families with? Oh, not other than trust yourself. Enjoy your baby. Do the things that bring mental wellness. You know, don't get so caught up in all the other parts and pieces. Place high value in mental wellness mm -hmm. and just enjoying your baby. Do the things that mm -hmm. you need to do as your family unit to enjoy your baby because they're just baby so little time. Yeah. They're going to grow up. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. So, thank you again, Kathy for doing this. And if someone wants to reach out to you, how could they find you? Best thing is in your show notes, childbirthconcierge.com. Our phone number is on there and I'm pretty accessible. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me and allowing me to share my year's experience. Of course. Of course. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I love it too. Thank you so much. You bet. And thank you families for listening. and. Again, listen to your gut and know that there are resources out there for you. And don't be afraid to get a second opinion if your gut's telling you that you need that. And if you are enjoying the show, please share it with a friend. And you can rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts because that helps to get this valuable information to more families. So thank you again for listening. For more great conversations like these, or to find out more information and access Michelle's library of amazing guests, go to birthdeeservices.com forward slash podcast. For more information on the birthdees method, Michelle's classes, meditations, and other services, go to birthdeeservices.com.